Um, what I'd like to talk about today is the economic impact of smart ledgers on world trade. And that is very much a, a theme that's been running. Um, I'm going to open with a few remarks. Um, I hope to speak for about uh, 30 minutes. And then uh, Vinay says it'd be kind of fun to close with a short, sharp panel of about 20 minutes today. And so hopefully we will break at 5 if I keep to time. Um, I've also uh, put on your seats a uh, handout which summarizes the current state of the research that we're at. Um, I'm afraid I'm not the best on infographics and things, but it's a kind of an interim report. The final report is due out in April, um, but that is the sum total of this talk, just to kind of walk you from the beginning and close on this report. So I won't be offended if you're glancing at it uh, while I'm chatting. Don't, don't take it uh, at all seriously. Um, I, I'm conscious that many of you know me and that some of the slides here will be uh, somewhat repetitious. Those of you who find I'm going through them rapidly, well, I am. Um, and you can, uh, you can uh, come up afterwards if you need uh, further justification or what have you. I'll cover briefly uh, who are Zien and, uh, and, and what is our role in life, um, our focus on smart ledgers. I want to look at uh, what do smart ledgers actually do for trade and trading systems. Um, but I, as I said, I'd like to close on the economic impacts um, that we can have our discussion session. <coughs> Zien. Uh, Zien is, we, we argue, uh, the City of London's leading commercial think tank. We've been in existence for 24 years. We're a small house, about 25 people, and we pretty much range where the finance and technology meet, uh, as well as technology itself, uh, doing things on like low-loss, uh, long-distance, high-voltage cables uh, at the physics end, um, and we also do pure financial work, uh, which has got very little to do with technology. So we're we span a lot of things. Uh, we have, obviously, like any firm, a fair number of credentials. In the space of fintech, though, or you know, technology actually meeting finance, I'm afraid I'm not a big aficionado of the word fintech. I moved into the city in 84 for Big Bang. You know, what the heck do you think I've been doing uh, for 34 years but putting computers into technology? And a little bit of lipstick on a retail pig on a British bank doesn't really interest me. Um, so, you know, <laughs> great. You put it on your phone. Well done. Um, so I'm, I'm much more into the high wholesale end of life and you know, where things matter, which is, I think, what is very exciting about the distributed ledger, smart ledger space. Um, you might notice something else here. Um, uh, one is my age, uh, young women uh, who are interested. Uh, my wife is away this weekend. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm really younger than I look, uh, <laughs> but unfortunately, I am happily married. Uh, and so one of the things I'd point out is that we built our first distributed ledger back in 1995. I currently am running a research pro program at the moment called Prior Smarts, where we really dig into it. You would be stunned at the number of blockchains that existed as early as 1978. Um, you would truly be stunned. If you actually dig into the research papers and you take the terminology out and you start looking at what the people were doing, it's there. We happen to do it in 95, so we're not even claiming we're early or first. Uh, and in fact, the blockchain instantiation of a distributed ledger isn't a particularly great way to do it. Um, so there are a lot of different architectures out there that achieve uh, similar or better purposes. So um, therefore, we, we get into terminology wars. Um, if you uh, Google some of the stuff I've done over the years, you'll find that I am a bit of a stickler for the terminology because I just hate the word blockchain. I can live with most other things, but you know, to me, it's kind of like saying, well, the, you know, there's a pointer. Uh, what do you mean? The database has a pointer in it. Well, what do I want? Oh, I want one of those pointer things. Well, don't you want a database? No, I want a pointer. I don't care. <laughs> And I kind of go, well, yeah, great, but, uh, but what are we driving at here? So um, I think we, most of us in the room know where we are. Ledgers, uh, nice, solid, boring pieces of accounting kit, uh, you know, records, whatever have you. Keep civilization together, minor detail. Uh, distributed, well, you know, anything that's distributed is interesting because it increases the resilience. That's the whole basis behind the, the internet, TCP, IP, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, as somebody who's been on the net since 76, you know, no 12. Um, used to chat with Vin Cerf to try and get the servers working for him harder at Dartmouth. You know, it's, it's what it's all about. But it also introduces an instability. You know, there is no such thing as decentralization. If you distribute the things, then you've got to run an identical copy of the software every day to make the darn stuff work or work on a similar standard. So um, we then move into mutual. Um, people in business tend to have the, the hardest time with the concept of mutual because mutual is in one sense, it's owned by everybody, and in another sense, it's owned by nobody. It depends on how you structure the mutual. Uh, I would argue the internet is owned by nobody, so a mutual in that sense. But we could equally set up an exchange mutual where we've all got uh, a participation or in it. 
Uh, one of the things I particularly have trou troubles with with people in business is they go, well, we've never done this before. And I go, well, do you know how email works? Uh, well, I don't, but you know, and they, they may be paying a lot of money to Microsoft at the tail end of the stuff, but they completely forget GNU Linux in the middle uh, and all the servers and all the donated <laughs> time. So there's not really that much new about mutual. So you put it all together, you know, I like the term mutual distributed ledger uh, for the basics, but then of course people want to put smarts in it. Uh, so you want to put pieces of program elements. Again, uh, those of you who ever did anything proper in Lisp will know this goes back to 1958. So again, it's not particularly new. Um, but it's nice that we've got this out there. It's nice that we've got acceptance. Um, it's nice that Bitcoin created enough Purori and all that, where people go from, my God, the last thing I want is my data on different machines to please spread my data to the four winds so I can have a blockchain. Um, so, you know, it, it's kind of interesting. Now, we do a lot of research to back up my prejudices. You'll gather I don't have too many, but the few I have, I like to justify. Uh, and, we, <laughs> and we have some uh, loads and loads of reports. Uh, we just brought out a report last week. Sorry, no, we're going to talk about this week on uh, what are the effects of quantum computing on smart ledgers. And quite interestingly, uh, this is probably the most vulnerable sector to quantum computing as opposed to anything else. Why? Well, we're trying to build databases for 100 years. And if you remember, before 99, we failed to do that. So this is round two to see if we can build a database for 100 years. And we're writing data out onto these databases that we would like to have accessible uh, you know, permanently. So think very hard about the data that you're putting out if you do not have a quantum resistant approach to it. The data you're writing out now, will it be embarrassing 20 or 30 years from now? If not, and there's quite a few cases where that's not the case, no problem. But if so, uh, things you need to think about. So we're very active in researching it. Most of the research that we do is, is free and shared. Uh, two more slides. I'm going to show you some examples of what we do, and then we'll move on to the economic impact. So um, my, my, this slide here is really just to emphasize one thing about them. When uh, I think Joe and I have had um, our, Joe, Joe and I are deep thinkers. We meet in hallways. We talk long and hard, 15, sometimes 20 seconds with each other. Um, and I keep saying to Joe, it's just time stamping. You know, what we got here is just time stamping. Uh, you, know, you can put a token on it if you like. You chew up a lot of energy, but you're still just doing some time stamping. Um, so there's some interesting problems, I think, in this space. So what's good about it? Well, it's actually that it's a multi-organizational database with a really good audit trail. That's what we're talking about, a pretty basic uh, piece of kit. I've already said it's old. It's really not that complicated. It's also a pretty crap database. You know, it's slow. You've got to keep a lot of things in sync. It's flat file. And anybody who's going to do anything practical is going to roll that database up into a buffer database, and, and therefore you're not really working on it. So you've got really just a ledger of record. Now, that's still a very powerful thing. And the reason it's powerful is it is an economic argument. It reduces the power of central third parties. That's what it does. Central third parties are finding themselves in a position, not where they're gone, we'll come on to that in a minute or over the discussion, but where they are weakened. And that's really got to do with uh, two things. Some of their functions flow immediately into the technology. So you know, normally the central third party keeps the ledger. That's their job. They, they keep the ultimate copy of the ledger. I bring up your university, have you got a degree? And they go back to the ledger and say yes or no. Uh, or maybe, in my case, whatever. Um, so, you know, so that's the kind of thing that you have. Uh, the second thing, though, is because that, by doing that, I've also reduced the switching costs. Why is that? Well, I do not like the central third party that's running uh, that ledger. And they say to me, no, no, it's, it's my ledger. It's my data. We say, well, no, it's not your data. Everybody's got a copy. We don't like you adding new entries to the ledger. We're going to switch you. So that's the economic argument behind it. Central third parties reduce switching costs, uh, and that, that's the key element. Now, the other thing that's interesting, of course, and I do find intriguing, is the role, really, of, uh, of the executable code. Um, I think that is absolutely fascinating. And you know, in a way, in my world, I, I look at uh, tokens, code, and the distributed ledger. I see it as a triangle, any two of which is essential to do the job. I think you can do a lot of the job without any tokens at all, just with executable code and a, and a decent ledger. So what are the sort of, sort of things that we do? Well, um, here's one example. Uh, we've been running for almost three years now um, the government time stamping engine for the states of Alderney. It's a small project, let's be frank. Um, 2,000 people, 2,000 drunkards clinging to a rock in the middle of the channel. Uh, and, and that's what they call themselves. Uh, so <laughs> uh, they do. 
It's ama amazing self-awareness in the Channel Islands. Um, and, uh, you know, but, but, but they're using it. Uh, another example, uh, much more material in the clinical trial space, um, sorry, in the clinical trial space, uh, we do a lot of stuff on clinical assessments. Oops, sorry. Uh, in clinical trial space, this is a heat map of clinical assessments that we do for a variety of people. Um, the one I can name is actually the University of Middlesex. Uh, they don't do a particularly large amount of work on it. Um, some of our private clients do quite a bit. We did 8.2 million clinical assessment recordings in 2016, and we did uh, 15 million clinical assessment recordings last year. So what is it? Well, it's a time stamping engine. You know, it's just a gigantic ledger recording you know, what's going on. And why is that? You know, well, it's actually so people don't cheat. These are anti-cheating devices. That's what they do. Uh, and it's, again, where multiple organizations have been trying to work together and in some way, shape, or form fudge the data. Now, why would I be up here? Why would I care about all this if I wasn't excited in some way? I'm going to put a little cold water on things, but not a lot. Um, I'm actually really excited about areas like identity. So for me, uh, these things are about identity, documentation, and agreement exchange. Um, and if you look at broadly four abstract application areas, identity, documentation, agreement, and payments, and as the previous speaker pointed out, you know, payments isn't a big thing. Payments isn't really a big thing. Up until last year, for over 20 years, I ran a commercial vessel. Trust me, you know, a commercial vessel, when you move it, there's a lot of paperwork, tons of paperwork. And take a piece of paper, and I mean this in the abstract computer sense, you know, whatever you like, it's still paper. I got to fill the darn thing in and I send it to somebody. Well, that somebody is working in another organization or working in the government or working with the, uh, the Maritime Coast Guard Agency or Lloyd's Register or something like that. Well, their job is worthless if they don't question that paper, isn't it? I mean, that's their job. So what do they do? Yeah, come on, you've all been subject to this. They send the paper back to me. And they've got some queries, and they bounce it back and forth. So it's proof that they've done some really valuable work. Yeah. And then they send it to their boss, who then says, well, you know, out of every 20 of these, I better bounce something back, or my job's not going to be any good. So the thing keeps bouncing around. Now, if you need 40 pieces of paper to move a boat, you know, you start multiplying that by a number of times people bounce the things back. I can come to a sum, and you can come to any sum you like, but it's something like 20 to 40 bucks per document. You know, it's what it's going to cost. It's an hour's worth of somebody's time normally. Uh, so it costs money. You say, well, it doesn't cost you that money. Yeah, but then I pay the application fee uh, for the manifest. So it, it does cost me that. And then some banker comes in and says, whoa, whoa, look at this, look at this. I can use a distributed payment system. And sometime in the distant future, when this is actually accepted, and I'm not lying about my proof of concept being real, um, what I'd like to show you, what I'd really like to show you is that I could reduce this to maybe like, you know, five bucks from 10 bucks. I'm sitting there saying, I just spent 2,000 bucks moving a vessel from one port to another in paperwork, and you're gonna save me $5. Well, I was gonna save you $5 until the cost of processing of Bitcoin went through the roof. So really, I need to charge you 35 or 40 bucks, plus the five bucks I need to make to make a profit on it. But anyway, it's a really cool thing. So you can see where I stand on identity, cool. You know, documentation, big savings for me and this and that. You know, what was the version of the document you had and all that? Agreement, yeah, definitely. Payments, not at all. Brilliant, brilliant incident at Cybus 18 months ago in Geneva when uh, the chap from MasterCard was there. Uh, Ripple had announced that in eight weeks with eight programmers, they managed to do a payment in eight minutes. It only cost $8. And some guy from MasterCard put his weedly little hand up and said, excuse me, I just want to understand what I'm seeing. What do you mean? I just want to understand what I'm seeing. Because, you know, in MasterCard, we kind of move money around the world in, in kind of five seconds for about three cents. Yeah. If MasterCard didn't exist, it would help to set it up so that a central third party doesn't have control. But MasterCard is a long way uh, to compete against these systems. So um, the, one of the myths that I, I like to tackle is that we're going to get rid of central third parties. I said we would weaken them. You know, I said that we can reduce the switching costs. But I, I think what you find is the minute you try and push far out on the Ethereum and Bitcoin end, you, you immediately run into governance problems, governance about how these systems are going to evolve. Uh, and 
that's why I'm you know, very excited about the sponsors of this conference, Materium, because I think they've recognized that and they're trying to work and make these things work in the real world. The world, real world does not you know, let the robots run it. Uh, and it may be at some point in the future, but it'll be long after I'm dead or after this afternoon when you all try and kill me. Anyway, um, I think the second thing is that economics don't matter. Um, and this slide is, is achingly old and I didn't have time to update it because as you know, the cost of processing of transactions has gone through the roof in line with the mining costs. Um, but you know, real world applications are going to need are going to need to be millisecond and they're going to need to be cheap. I mean, anybody who comes in and says, I'm, I'm giving you a database right for $5 or $35 is an idiot, okay? You know, I just cannot see what that application is that justifies it. Uh, I, I assure you when we did 15 million clinical assessments the other last year, we did not get $35 a pop or $5 a pop or anything close to that. The rig costs about $15,000 a year to run. So that's kind of, the, that's the real world. Um, we therefore have been running some of our achingly old systems. They're not very trendy. They're just things that work, that work fast. Um, so we tested with National Physical Laboratory, a rig. Uh, we did 25 billion transactions a day. Convert that, you know, the, the reverse of that is obviously the cost per transaction, which is fractional. Um, and in fact, the NPL agreed that we could do about a trillion transactions a day with a moderately scaled up rig. It's just not the one that we gave them. So, you know, that's more of what we're talking about. Why? We'll go back to shipping. Shipping is a global industry. If we're going to have a global unowned mutual commons, it's going to need to do a lot of transactions and at costs that are affordable. So I thought what we ought to do is work towards the numbers. And so we launched uh, the Linda Distributed Futures Research Program. We launched uh, a report of which uh, Vinay kindly asked me to come and present. And it's not quite done, so you're, you're kind of getting a preview. Uh, and uh, it'll be coming out in April, as it says on the, on the handout that I put on your seats. Um, what, what, what prompted this report? Well, the first thing was I wanted to get a handle on what was the scale of savings that we could actually have uh, within trade. I mean, people talk about it. They talk about the grotesque wastefulness in the numbers, uh, and that's great. Um, and I've talked about the frustration of the documentation, but I would like to understand what the potential scale is. Um, I was at a conference up uh, in Sweden, actually with you, Vinay, in November, uh, when a chap from NASDAQ was haranguing the Swedish electricity industry about their cost of settlement. He kept saying, you know, you should put it on a blockchain. You'll save tons of money, and we, NASDAQ, will do this for you, and blah, blah, blah. And uh, a question was put to him. Well, that's great, but what's it going to mean for the average Swedish consumer? Well, huge savings. We get rid of the wastefulness in the industry and the clearing of the settlement. It's going to be really, really important and all that. Yeah, but how much are we going to save? Well, you know, all the people who, yeah, okay, fine. Are there 5,000 people in this? Well, he says to me, no. Uh, 500? Well, I'm not too sure. 50? Uh, with this, the head of the CEGB gets up and goes, yeah, this guy's been talking to us for three years about all the great savings he's going to make. We keep showing him the door, and he doesn't understand. What's that? Well, there's probably about 50 people in this. So if you take a savings of 50 people, you divide it by 9 million suites, you're not even talking about a few kroner per per payment. So actually, some of these sums can be quite modest. They sound great. You know, they could be very important in particular spot areas. But in terms of overall savings, they may be modest. So we're doing some work uh, with, the, with the Singaporeans. Uh, we built a trade system, which was launched uh, last November. It's got about 500 companies on it. So I'm starting to accrue genuine data on activities and savings in, in this area. Now, the Asian uh, trade area is, is a large one. We know that, you know, 609 billion and growing and blah, blah, blah. Uh, imports and exports extremely substantial between them. In this space, we see um, a lot of competition. Uh, probably the biggest competition in this space is Alibaba. And uh, just as many people here fear Amazon, you know, if you travel in the Far East, they fear Alibaba. Why? Central third party. Here we go again. It's a central third party. Now, does Singapore want to create a Singababa? I wouldn't think so. You just wind up with Singapore fighting Alibaba, and that's not a good thing. That's, that's a trade war you don't want to get into. Uh, so what they really did was they created, effectively, an unowned ledger. That was the key element to it. And they based it, and happened to base it, on our ChainZ software, which is really simply because it's hyper cheap, runs very, very fast, and frankly does the job. Um, and so that's what they wanted. Um, they've got some interesting estimates of the revenues that they'll make, blah, blah, blah. But these aren't necessarily the savings. Okay, that, that's very important. So this, uh, 
just because you, you managed to pull some revenue estimates in, how much do you pull from other people to the problem? Uh, this is a slide of the, the cover screen, just to prove that uh, we can have a cover screen with a, with a login area. Uh, um, but this gives you just a little bit of the flavor of the depth of it. So anything you can imagine in Alibaba is effectively been built here. You know, so I'd like to buy some erasers from you. I'd like to buy some pencils from you. I'd like you to please put the pencils and erasers together and ship it to them. And it's all this kind of interaction. Uh, the Prudential and five banks are in there providing the trade credit and finance for it. So again, it's quite a, quite a sizable real system based on blockchain. Um, if you want to call it blockchain, I prefer to call it smart ledger, but there you go. Um, what's intriguing about it um, is that, again, as I said earlier, the architecture for it is very much uh, down there at the bottom. That's the distributed ledger bit. That's the ledger of record. That's the ledger that everybody synchronizes with. Uh, but above it, you need to do, build all the normal IT that you would have for anything else. In fact, if the tough stuff up top existed, you could easily do it just as a simple write out. So the great blockchain revolution or transformation isn't really that transformative or complicated. It's just simply getting people to agree to use a ledger of record. Now we are, uh, we're, we're very excited about this project no less, but the reason is probably because our firm's only 25 people. So a project like this is really good for us. A project like this is you know, not even a day's fees for Accenture. Uh, doing the PowerPoints to think about it. So, you know, you've got a kind of a, a problem here in scale. And I think this leads you into some interesting problems about how you estimate uh, what the savings are. Now, in my world uh, of economic analysis, I boil savings um, and improvements down into three things. Um, and I, I would ask you to imagine with me, if you might, uh, imagine a kind of a, a distribution function. So this is my distribution function. Okay, and in the middle is the kind of my expected outcome. And you know, over here, well, let me see if I get this right now. For you folks over here, you know, is kind of very bad, and over here is very good, okay? And so what can you do in life? Well, the first thing uh, that you can do is you can move the distribution function to very good. You know? and, so, and that's actually what most people do. Um, it's how do, you, how do you achieve that? Well, you reduce costs, you make more profit, that's cool. You train your staff so they're more effective, that's, that's really cool. You get better marketing, you know, that, that's, that's really cool. So that's, that's improving it. Second thing you can do is you get rid of some of the bad stuff. You know, I want to lop off the stuff over here, I just want to get rid of it. Uh, well, what if it was a fire? Well, that's a good idea, let's buy some fire insurance, you know, and, and off you go. Uh, I'd like to reduce wastage, I'd like, like to reduce uh, my loss of goods. You know, so all that stuff over there, so I lop off the bad stuff. The third bit, which is the subtle bit, is I could, in fact, increase certainty. I could pull that distribution together a little bit. And that actually has value. Um, in financial theory terms, it really turns the volatility in your potential outcomes. It, it reduces the volatility. And you can price that as effectively a variation of either a call or a put option. And that gives you a value. Um, we've been doing this technique for 20 or 30 years. It's just often overlooked by people in that area. And that, in many ways, applies to what's going on in this space, because you've got different levels here. So down at the uh, technology level, down at the base, which is, which is fairly simple, I really don't see much that's increased in terms of revenue. In fact, it's an additional cost to have even this tiny little ledger out there being the ledger of record. Um, but what I am doing is I'm, I'm reducing a lot of risk over there on the documentation. <coughs> Next level up the business process stuff. Well, I'm definitely improving my outcomes because what I'm achieving here is a cost reduction in all the paperwork and the processing and the claims and the, and the, and the bureaucracy. And then at the very top level, I'm actually increasing certainty. And that's very, very important, particularly in areas like trade and logistics. You know, what I need to know is that my supplier is coming through the chain. Uh, and this has a number of other knock-on effects. Um, Longer supply chains are bad, but longer supply chains are good. Why is that? Well, if I'm using the right type of supply chain, then I'm going to be providing a better product. I'm also, therefore, increasing specialization globally. And as we know from economic theory, specialization is probably the biggest driver in terms of improvement. So these are the sorts of things that you want to come together with. So we, um, we decided we'd, we'd kind of try and pull it all together in, in this report. Um, and I'm afraid the early indications aren't really that thrilling. Um, just to give you a flavor, uh, we're looking at uh, something like uh, 
15 to 27 billion um, a year increase um, over the next five years as, as we move forward. But it's a big planet out there. So 25 billion divided by the planet uh, starts to sound a lot like the Swedish uh, energy industry. Okay, so you know savings definitely worth doing definitely, but you know against the cryptocurrency valuations, a um, little tough to figure that one out. So I'll leave it there. I know they're slightly different worlds, but I'm trying to give you a flavor of the scale of these things when you look at it from a global economic point of view. Second thing is that volatility reduction, of which I'm so fond, we're coming up with an estimate circa 1 to 1.5 billion a year. Not very, very high at all. And we're clearly testing a lot of our assumptions, trying to see what gaps we're missing. Uh, we're conscious that there are potential savings in the area of answer money laundering and know your customer. But these numbers uh, do not justify um, all the tokens that are out there claiming that they're going to be you know, intrinsic stores of infinite eternal value. So I'm, you know, I have some, some, some qualms here. And finally, we, we, we've obviously looked at this because politicians don't give a damn about numbers. Heck, you know, we can't count above 10. Um, uh, and that's hoping that they've, they found their other hand. Um, the point is that, you know, what we, what we struggle with here is uh, jobs possibly in the order of about a million jobs spread across the planet, you know. So we're talking about an interesting area, something that clearly needs to be done, something with some savings, but I'm afraid, you know, I've been unable to find the mega blockchain revolution that's going to really turn up in genuine trade, bureaucracy, et cetera, numbers, and, uh, and justify some of the valuations of what many people talk about. Very worthwhile, I hope, because I want to do it too, uh, but not that big. So, in a, you know, kind of in a funny sense, um, you know, you've noticed that there are fish all over the planet, and they're going to be big, you know, and I run a pet store in London. I'm trying to tell you that, you know, hey, I, all the fish on the planet I, I ain't going to fit in my fish store. Um, and I hope that's at least a kind of a sobering thought on a Friday without being too depressing. <laughs> Vinay, over to you. Thank you.